how y'all doing today? My name is Bernie Thompson and today we're here to take a look at this 2009 Ford E250 van. This van has a 4.6 V8 engine and it's exhibiting misfires on 2 and 8. In order to repair this vehicle, the shop has replaced the spark plugs, coils, and the injectors. This vehicle, this is the third time that this vehicle has been returned for this problem. So what we need to do is we need to actually diagnose it so it doesn't make a fourth trip back. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and I want to get a scan tool and get a scan tool connected to this so we can get some data. Now we've got the scan tool connected to this E250. What we want to do is look at some basic data. We can see that we have fuel control and we're centered, so that's good. The fuel trims don't have a problem and the bank-to-bank -bank trims don't have a problem. The engine is cold. We've just started it. It's 90 degrees. The engine vacuum is good. Our charging voltage is good. Now we have three DTC set and we have two monitors that haven't been run. Now since the monitors haven't been run, that's just an indication that someone has cleared the code and they've driven it a bit. And we already know that because they've been working on this vehicle trying to get this problem resolved. Um, we want to look at the DTCs. Now the DTC is a random misfire, a misfire on cylinder one and a misfire on cylinder two. Now the two cylinders that the shop has indicated to me that I'm supposed to be looking at is two and eight. So two and eight, I guess, have been the repetitious cylinders uh, they didn't say anything about one, but apparently one has some misfires. So one of the things I want to do here is I want to go to mode six. So we want to go ahead and we want to get mode six data here, and we want to pick Ford, and then we want to run the mode six. Ford mode six data is pretty good for the misfire data. So we definitely want to see what it's going to tell us, what cylinders might be having an issue. Um, so right here we can see that on Cylinder 8, we have 19 misfires. All these others are zero. Then we want to come back up here. And we can see Cylinder 2 has 28 misfires. And we can have Cylinder 1 has 24 indicative. So basically, 1, 2, and 8 are all showing that I have misfires indicative. That's why we have a P0300, a random misfire. Now, due to the problem of this car, we don't want to just drive the car initially with the scan data and get some data. Um, since this car has misfires, apparently, I want to go ahead and I want to hook a scope up. Now, what I want to hook the scope up to is the crank sensor and ignition for number one. Then we can do a process where we look at the crank velocity changes, how fast the crank is going faster or slower. So when we get a misfire, the crank slows down and we'll be able to see which cylinder really is misfiring. It's always super important, don't believe the scan tool. You can't just look at this data and think those cylinders are what's missing. I'd never know that. I always have to confirm which cylinders are missing so we know we're working on the correct cylinder for the engine. Since this is, has eight cylinders, uh, they could all be missing. Maybe none of them are missing. Maybe one of them is missing. But I never totally believe scan data. This is a point for me to get really quick information so I can make some diagnostic decisions. I've looked at the data. I know I need to drive the car. We want to make sure we don't have fuel controls and all of that. But along with that, before we're going to go on a test drive, I want to make sure that I have a way to validate which cylinders are missing when I feel it miss, okay? So we're going to go ahead and get the scope set up on this E250. I've opened up a wiring diagram for this E250, this 4.6 engine. We need two components. I need the crankshaft position sensor and I need the ignition coil for cylinder one. Here's the crankshaft position sensor and it's indicative that I need the yellow violet wire, that's the positive lead, and I can come down here and I can see that in this connector, right here I've got the positive leg of the CKP. I also need the number one ignition coil and that's right here and he's got a white violet wire and that wire also goes into the same connector right here. So these two wires that I need are in this same connector. So then is what I did is I came up and I found the microprocessor, the ECU for this engine, and I found the wires and I've located them in the second harness and we're going in and we're just gonna wire pierce these. 
I don't want to disconnect any of the system where I would unplug it and take part of the connector where I could get into there. Don't like disconnecting anything, especially when I haven't worked on the car and I don't know if I'm changing something. In this way, I'm in the wires, but I haven't made any error by unplugging and plugging a connector or moving the connector around extensively to try to get the plastic cover off so I could back probe these. When we're done, we'll go ahead and we'll plastic coat those wires and this is a very good test. I really don't like to disconnect things until I know why I'm disconnecting them. We've also connected the negative position of the scope to the negative side of the battery so we can have proper testing. I round the wires inside the vehicle so we can actually go for a test drive and we can monitor these circuits and that way as soon as we feel the engine miss we can process this data and we'll know which one of the cylinders is actually missing. So let's go ahead and get the scope connected and make sure we're in the wires and that the system is operational before we get on the road. We have the e-scope connected up to this 4.6 engine. The first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we're connected and we are. So we can see the red lights are out. We have 14 volts, that's the ignition coil. We too have two and a half, that's the bias that would be riding on a Ford CKP sensor. So then I wanna make sure that we have good data. So we wanna just take a little bit of data here. And we've got the data. We can see that the crank indicates that we're, we're okay here. We wanna take a zoom window. We wanna come in and look at these. We can see that this is the crank. This missing tooth is the indexing. This looks like a 36 minus one would be what I'm looking at here. And we can go through this. Okay, so this is good. And so we wanna go ahead, we're gonna just do a quick clean on this and then we're gonna come over here. I wanna go ahead and I wanna run this right here. I need to know the firing order. So basically this firing order is 1372. So we're gonna come back over and now we're gonna pick that firing order. So we've got one three seven two six five four eight and now I'm going to just run it. If I have the data over here and I want to run that data onto this screen I process the data here and that's going to give me an indication of what's over here. We're going to take our zoom window here and we're going to come in and look at this. Wow. This is a really unusual problem guys. The crank trigger is loose on this car. This, I thought we were gonna be looking for a misfire. We're not. This is a crank sensor. The crank trigger wheel, it's loose. Let me explain how I already know this. So if we come in here and we blow this up, do you see how on cylinder three, the crank sped up, slowed down, sped up, slowed down, sped up and slowed down? Do you see these ripples that are happening in here? Well, that's one cylinder event. I should have fired it. This is top dead center where the pink mark is. The crank should have gone faster for firing the fuel, and then it should have slowed down as I came up on the next cylinder to compress the air. These should be humps all the way through here. I've only had a couple of these cars. I've done maybe three. And when you get this ripple like this, it's indicative that the crank trigger is loose. Physics says the crank, once I have the mass in rotating motion and it's rotating, that rotation can't slow up and speed up in one fire cycle. Do you see all these? Do you see how I've got a ripple down here and it's rippling? Well, this ripple is because the wheel is slipping on the shaft and that target wheel, the trigger wheel, is not tight on the shaft. It actually is moving. Um, this is really cool. This is really unusual. You just don't see many of these type of cars or these type of problems. But again, you can see continuously we have these rippling effects through here. Okay, so I don't want to go on a test drive now because this data has just changed everything I want to do. 
Now is what I want to do is I want to take the number one coil out, or any coil, I want a coil out, and I want to put a compression transducer in the cylinder, and I want to compare peak pressure against this crank sensor. Now what that's going to do is the peak pressure is going to give me a point of reference and the crank sensor should stay at the same position on each one of the top dead center peak marks. If the crank sensor is moving compared to the peak, it proves the wheel is loose and then the shop's going to need to pull the front of this motor apart. So we'll deal with all that later. I want to prove it. I know this waveform though. This waveform is a loose trigger, guys. So now what we need to do is let's go ahead and get the engine shut off and get the coil out so we can do the next test. got a 300 pound pressure transducer in cylinder number one. Whenever you put a pressure transducer in, you've got the coil out. We always want the coil to fire, and so if it's firing, I can get the electrical data from it so I can see when that pulse happened, especially when it's in relative position to the top dead center position or the peak pressure. Once you've got the coil out, you're going to have to terminate it. As you can see, I've got this lead and it's going to the coil and it comes up to ground and I've got it terminated. That way I won't damage the pressure transducer or anything on the vehicle. The next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and we want to come in here and we want to pick a 300 pound pressure transducer and we want to zero it. Now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and start this vehicle up and we want to then analyze the data. So let's get the data by starting the vehicle. So we're collecting some data here. The first thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and we want to zoom in on this. So we want to look at these peaks right here. So I'm going to get the cursors, and the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to go to the ignition fire cycle. So we want to get these right on, so we're going to need to get the cursor, and we want to be right on the, where we fired the first one. And we want to come in and we want to be right on where the second one is. want to mark these. So what I'm interested in is looking at all of these line up first. So we can see where the pink line marked. Do you see how we're not on the first strike? We're off of it. We're still not on the strike. We're off of it. We're off of it. We're way off of it. We're way off of it. We're off of it. We're close, and we're on it. Now what this indicates is that that trigger wheel is moving. When you take one fire cycle and you put a grid on it, the grid should mark all of my fire cycles, whether this is an ignition coil or we we're working on a diesel and these are diesel fuel injectors. In one fire cycle, whether the engine is missing or not, the gridding should cross over each one. When it doesn't, it's telling me I have a problem. Sometimes that might be the magnetic intensity from the sensor is not working correctly so I can't mark it. Other times maybe a trigger wheel is in motion and it's not tightened to the shaft and that would cause it. But when you mark these, they should come down right on or very, very close to each one of the ignition strikes. So we don't see that. So next thing we want to do is we want to come in and we want to just look at where we've got our crossing so we're going to go ahead and turn off the ignition now. And now what I want to do is we want to take the... our cursors. And we 
want to go ahead and mark them again. And we take, want to take the zoom, and we want to look at this. Now, where that's crossing, basically, we want to look at where we have our missing index, and we would have uh, one, two, three, four, five, and we're crossing towards the top of that hump right there, right towards a quarter down. Then, if we come over here, it should be in the exact same spot, but it's a little bit lower. It's not high. It's, it's more towards the middle. It's not as high. So that indicates that that guy has moved a little. So we want to come over here and we want to take another set of these. So in this case, we're going to come in and we're going to come right over here. We're going to do the same thing. Then we want to go ahead and we want to take the zoom in. And we want to see that we got one, two, three, four, and we're towards the top again on that one. So it's sort of like the first one we looked at. And here again, we're towards the top. So that looks like it's fairly steady right there. We want to go in over here again, and we want to do the same type of thing. Here we've got one, two, three, four, five, and we've moved quite a bit on this side over here. We want to come over here and we want to look at the same thing. And we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, and we're on the fifth one. So we see we're at the top of the fifth one here. And again, we're going to go back over here and we're going to look at this. And we can see one, two, three, four, five, and we're over here. This is indicative that the, the top dead center position, the TDC point, or the peak pressure is going to be continuous as long as the engine isn't surging or having air changes. If the volume going into the engine is steady, that point of peak pressure should be very steady. If I use it to compare against on the crank waveform, I can see that that crank waveform is moving and there's no way it can move if it was solidly attached to the crank shaft. This is just proving what we already have found out through the misfire data to where the ripples are there. So if we came back over here and we ran, the, we're going to run this data that we have over here, come back over here and we run this, now we're going to see these ripples again, which is again an indication of of a problem. We can see that we've got these multiple ripples in here. Um, this is just an indexing point that's not been taken out by the software, so don't be worried about that. But do you see I have three ripples in one box? So if we look at these boxes, do you see how these ripples are present through boxes? When we're at a steady state like an idle, it just shouldn't do that. So the idea here is is we first, we were just looking for the misfire, and it's a random misfire. We could see that by the scan tool data. And then we wanted to prove which cylinder was missing. We hooked up to the crank sensor, and we got on the ignition coil, and we just ran a test, and I could see this rippling all over. And those ripples are generally associated with some kind of a loose trigger wheel or a magnetic phenomenon in the sensor that's moving. Then we got a pressure transducer in it where we could have a good peak pressure, some kind of a mechanical indicator that we can compare against the crank sensor. Then we could see that the crank sensor is in motion and it's moving, and so that proves that the sensor is loose in this motor. So what the shop's going to need to do is pull the front of the motor apart, and we're going to have to figure out why the, tr the crank trigger can even be loose and repair that and then this vehicle will be ready to return to the customer. So now what we need to do is get the front of the motor off and check this crank sensor to see why we have the problem. We're back down at the shop where they've removed the front cover off of this Ford van so we can actually look at the trigger wheel. We've reassembled the assembly with the trigger wheel and the dampener and I want to show you what's going on. So let's take a look. As you can clearly see, that wheel is loose, and it is moving. 
now, is what happened is someone had put a front seal in this vehicle and when they put it back down they didn't torque that dampener all the way down to the proper settings and it allowed this uh, wheel to be moving in there. So now is what we're going to do is we're going to fix the dampener and we're going to get it to where it will trap that wheel and then the shop will put this all back together and then I'll come back and we'll take a look at the data. The shop has reassembled the front of this van motor and now the engine is running so we're here to check the crank sensor. I'm in the CKP and the number one ignition trigger at the PCM. They have a real easy access for me. So let's go ahead and take the scope and we're going to gather some data. So now we're going ahead and we're getting the data. And this is our data. I want to go ahead and I want to smooth this out. So we're going to put a smoothing feature. That's just so we can process this data better. This is what we're smoothing is this crank sensor. Now we're all familiar with this type of a waveform on this crank sensor. Now if I was looking at that crank sensor and I'm trying to figure out if that wheel is loose, it's going to be a really hard diagnosis. One of the hardest that I've encountered in my career. What I want to do is I want to show you how easy this can be. We need to come over here and we need to pick our firing order. And that's one, three, seven, two, and we're on one, so we're good to go. We're going to process this data. And now I want to go ahead and we want to zoom in on this data, so we'll take these guys here. I want to show you is what the difference was. Before, all we had was ripples, three ripples to two ripples in each box that were all the same size. That would indicate that the crank sped up, slowed down, sped up, slowed down, and sped up within one cylinder box. That's an indication that the crank sensor is loose from the crank. Remember that the crank wheel gives me a physical quantity. It's attached directly to the crank. As it's rotating and I'm picking up the magnetic intensity and it's changing it, that gives me where each trigger wheel is. The only way that it can be going faster and slower is if the trigger wheel is in movement and it's not attached firmly to that shaft. Now what we see is the crank trigger wheel is attached firmly and remember, this test is testing the physical condition of that sensor. Now look at this. Now we can see where we clearly, at top dead center, each one of these pink marks represents top dead center. I clearly accelerated and I deaccelerated. I The fuel fired and it accelerated. I went up and I caught the air on the next cylinder and I started to compress that air and the crank slowed down. I fired the fuel, I accelerated, I deaccelerated, I accelerated, I deaccelerated, I accelerated, I deaccelerated. Each one of these movements of the crank, as I fire the fuel, it goes faster and then it compresses the gas, slowing it down and then it fires. If I have a misfire, the whole crank will slow down. Now this isn't missing right now, but this shows that that crank trigger, it's attached. And that means that we're doing really good. So this car is fixed. So now is what we want to do, is we want to get some other data I want to show you guys. So we'll come over here and we'll blow this up. We'll get our cursors. We want to blow this up so we get the cursor close as we can. We don't want any offset in here, so we want a zero. So we're zero offset. We want to go ahead and pick the firing order on this. So we're 1372. We're going to go ahead and mark this. 
Now the first thing I want to show you is do you see how the missing index piece is right here and the missing index piece is right here? That's on cylinder 2 and cylinder 8. Well those are the two cylinders that we're indicating a misfire. When the crank trigger is moving back and forth and it's loose, the PCM doesn't have the same amount of information because I have a tooth missing. Those are edges that I could have counted that aren't there. So now having a minimum amount of data there, it's throwing a misfire code for those two cylinders where the missing index is. The next thing I want to show you is do you see how all these pink marks now are going through the front edge of this? So now is what that shows me is the crack sensor is firm. Now the way that these go through the front edge, that can also be a problem with the magnetic sensor. If the magnetic sensor, the the field has not a problem, I can get that to trip earlier or later and that can also give me some offset. But in this car, it's clearly the wheel was loose as we've already seen. This absolutely is one of the hardest diagnostics that I know of in my career and magnetized wheels is another. This car I diagnosed in 15 minutes due to the technology that we've developed. This just makes it really easy to find the problem. And you know, what would have happened if you didn't find this? A PCM, some more parts, eventually the car is sold, someone else buys it, they put more parts on, maybe they finally put a motor in it, when they put the motor in it's going to fix it because then the wheel is tight. If we really want accurate quick diagnostics, we really need to follow an accurate Think, thinking of exactly how we're going to go through each step and what we're going to do with this. If you follow a logical plan and you have and you have quality equipment, you too will be successful troubleshooting these kind of problems and other problems in your bay.